The end of the Australian financial year is just around the corner. So in this video, we're talking through five of the most common mistakes that Australian expats make when completing their Australian tax return. So let's dive right in and have a look at some of these common mistakes. Hi there, Jared Brown here, Australian expat financial planner here in Singapore, working with Aussies all over the world. Today, we're exploring some of the common mistakes uh, when it comes to completing tax returns back in Australia. Now, first and foremost, why would an Australian expat be completing an Australian tax return at all? Usually, if you still have taxable Australian income. Now, that's typically if you have a rental property generating rental income, or if you have a property that you have sold and there is a taxable capital gain. For a number of, number of other people, if you don't have taxable Australian income, you'll either not be lodging at all, or you may be lodging a non-lodgement advice. So in this video, let's dive into some of these common mistakes that we see people making time and time again. Number one is paying tax on the interest you earn in Australia. Now, by interest, I mean the interest on your savings in your Australian bank accounts. Far too often, people will either have their Australian address or their mum's address or a friend's address or a cousin's address still on file with their Australian bank. Now, what that means is that the Australian bank will typically declare that interest to the ATO and that interest will show up in your Australian tax return. But if you are a non-resident of Australia for tax purposes, you should not be paying tax on that interest. All the tax that should be applying is withholding tax, which is 10% of the interest that you earn. So if you earn 5% interest, there should be withholding tax of 0.5. So make sure you're checking your tax return. If it automatically feeds through to the ATO when you're completing your return, remove it and make sure that your Australian bank has your overseas address on file. So that is number one, tax on interest. Number two is capital gains tax on shares. Now we see this one time and time again, accountants getting confused or not filing things correctly. And that is where shares that you have bought and sold as, an, as a non-resident of Australia, so as a tax resident of Singapore or elsewhere, and still including them in your Australian tax return. So let's just say I bought Commonwealth Bank shares as a non-resident of Australia at $85, and I sold them at $100. Well, as a non-resident of Australia for both the purchase and the sale, my tax obligation to Australia is zero. There is no capital gains tax to pay, so they should not be included in my Australian tax return. But far too often we see some shares included, because they're under the tax-free threshold, which of course doesn't apply to expats either. So for your shares, for your investments, even though they might be listed or trading or domiciled in Australia, nine times out of 10, the tax obligation to Australia is also zero. So don't make the mistake of paying more tax than you need to be. If you have been declaring these things in your tax returns over previous years, then seek to revise them. Speak to your accountant, reach out to your advisor and get this cleaned up. Number three, property improvements. Now this is a big one we see people getting wrong. If you upgrade, you renovate, you make improvements to the bathroom, you replace the kitchen, whatever it might be, if you add value to the property, that is usually a capital improvement, not a tax deductible expense. The difference between the two are if you repair and maintain your property, for example, some tiles come loose and they need to be fixed, or the house needs to be repainted to bring it back to original conditions so it can be rented out. These are expenses that are usually claimed in the year that they are made, meaning that if we have $10,000 of rental income and $2,000 we spent to repaint the house, then our taxable income is 8,000 because we take the two off the 10. But if we renovate the bathroom and make upgrades, these are capital improvements, which therefore add to the cost base of our property. So if we spent $50,000 on improving it, 
and we bought it for 500, our new cost base is 550. That means that when we sell the property, that is when we realize the benefit of that expense, not each financial year. So make sure that we're filing these correctly, keep records, make sure you're keeping receipts and not claiming expenses when you shouldn't be. Number four is superannuation. Now this is a big one and there's always a few common mistakes that we see people making time and time again. One is making sure that contributions are treated in the way that you want them to be treated. The majority of super contributions for expats will go into super as non-concessional. That means after-tax money going into super. So we put $100 into super, $100 gets invested into whatever it may be. Now the other way super contributions can be treated is as concessional contributions. Now on concessional contributions, a 15% tax rate applies to that money which means that 100 goes in, 85 gets invested. Now the benefit of doing that is that $100 is now tax deductible. So if we had rental income or we sold a property, that's where that tax deductible super can become quite beneficial. So make sure that you're declaring correctly, make sure you're completing your notice of intent to claim a tax deduction form and make sure that the money goes into your super fund and clears before the end of financial year. You can't retrospectively contribute. We can't get into the first week of July, call up your super fund and say, hey, hey, I'm so sorry, I meant to do this last week. Can we just get it done now? The answer is no. It needs to be in and cleared by June 30 each and every financial year. Now, the final one is tax on Singapore income. So if you earn income in Singapore, whether it be shares or salary or other bonuses or variable components, you pay tax in Singapore on that income. Sounds straightforward enough. Most people don't get this one wrong. What they do often get wrong is when they're working remotely for an Australian based company. Now, in the event that you're working in Singapore, completing the work in Singapore, all of the work that you're doing, but being paid by an Australian company, the majority of time that income should be taxed right here in Singapore, not in Australia. So far too many people get this one wrong. They declare that in their Australian tax return, even though they are a non-resident of Australia. Now, of course, if you are moving back to Australia and bonuses or other variable income hits your account once you're back, you could be liable for the tax on that money once you have moved back into the country. But there you go, five or two common mistakes we see Australian expats making time and time again when it comes to their Australian tax return. So if you're unsure, seek advice, search online, reach out to your advisor, your accountant. If you find that you're not filing things correctly, you're not getting the right advice, your accountant's a bit unsure around what to do, then reach out to somebody who is familiar with working with expats. Thank you for tuning in. Do remember to like, subscribe to the channel. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.